In the next few sections, we want to look at properties of the Mobius function, including some of its applications and the Mobius inversion formula. First, I want to give some motivation for the Mobius function. And then we'll provide a formal definition. Uh, we'll want to show that the Mobius function is a multiplicative function, so add it to our collection of multiplicative functions and look in particular at the characteristic sum formula for the Mobius function. So this is what gives it all of its um, utility. Okay, so some motivation. So our, our goal is to find a multiplicative function mu that has the following characteristic function property. That if you look at the sum over the divisors of n, of mu of d, I want this to equal 1 if n is 1 and 0 for every other positive integer. So this quantity on the left then serves as a characteristic function for identifying when we are at the point 1. So it'll be 0 for all numbers other than 1. So in particular this property is going to allow us to invert summatory functions of this type. So we were looking at these types of functions last time. And I want to invert it and express little f in terms of capital F. And the Mobius function allows us to do that, and that's called Mobius inversion. Now there's a, a higher level motivation for the Mobius function what I call the analytic point of view. And this is discussed in one of the later chapters of my notes where we talk about Dirichlet series. So Dirichlet series are infinite series of the form sigma n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n over n to the s where the a sub n are complex numbers and s is a complex variable. The most important Dirichlet series is what we call the Riemann zeta function. So zeta of s is defined to be just the sum of 1 over n to the s power. So you saw series like these back in calculus when you studied the harmonic series. That would be putting s equal to 1, which of course diverges or more generally P series such as this one, sigma 1 over n squared, and, and this is a convergent series. So it turns out that a series of this type will converge for any complex number having a real part strictly greater than 1. Now it can be shown that if you take the reciprocal of the zeta function, it'll be another Dirichlet series, and the coefficients are going to come out to be this function we're defining right now, the Mobius function. So that's where it arises in a very natural way in analytic number theory. Okay, let's see if we can discover the function that would have this characteristic property we're looking for. So first of all, what would mu of 1 have to be? So I just let n equal 1, plug it into this formula. Well, the only positive divisor of 1 is 1, and so sigma d divides 1 of mu of d just means mu of 1, and I want that to come out to equal 1. Okay, so mu of 1 must equal 1. Next, let's try a prime. And it goes sigma d divides p mu of d. So that would be mu of 1 plus mu of p. We've already seen that mu of 1 is 1. And I want the outcome of this to be 0. So this sum is supposed to be 0 for every number other than 1. So this must equal 0, which implies that mu of any prime should be negative 1. 
Okay, next let's look at p squared, where p is a prime. Well, this time we're going to get mu of 1 plus mu of p plus mu of p squared. That's the sum over the, over the divisors. Should add up to 0, but we've already seen that this is a plus 1. This is a negative 1, so these two cancel out. And so we get that mu of p squared should be 0. Try one more, p cubed. P cubed, and you're going to see what happens at this point. That also should add up to 0. But all of this is 0, and this was 0, and therefore mu of p cubed is 0. And you can see by induction that mu of p to the k should be 0 for any k at least 2. Okay, so we know what mu of a prime power is, and we want this to be a multiplicative function. So what would mu of p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, pk to the ek equal? Well, that's just mu of p1 to the e1, mu of pk to the ek. So, if any of the exponents are 2 or greater, this is going to come out to be 0. So 0 of some ei is bigger than 1. The other choice is that all of the eis are equal to 1, and then we come up to this fact that mu of any prime is negative 1, so it'll be negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, k times. And that is the way we're going to define the Mobius function. So we're kind of thinking ahead. We want this property, and therefore the Mobius function has to be defined like this. So here's our formal definition. The Mobius function mu is defined to be 1 when n is 1, negative 1 to the k power if n is a product of k distinct primes, and 0 if n is divisible by the square of any prime. So that's exactly what we just saw on the previous slide. So the first thing we want to observe is that this function is a multiplicative function. So we're going to have to do a number of case studies here. So let a and b be natural numbers with GCD equaling 1. That's how we start every, every time you want to show a function's multiplicative. You start with two relatively prime numbers. Case 1. Suppose a equals 1 or b equals 1. Say without loss of generality it's a well then, mu of AB is mu of B, which is equal to mu of B. And just leave it like that. And mu of A times mu of B is, well, mu of 1 is 1. We saw that. So it's also mu of b. So we're getting exactly the same value. Thus, mu of a, b is mu of a, mu of b. Case 2. Suppose that a or b has a square factor. So suppose p squared divides a 
or p squared divides b for some prime p. Again, without loss of generality, say p squared divides a. Then, well, then p squared divides a times b, clearly. And so, mu of AB is what? Well, if it's divisible by the square of a prime, it's equal to 0. And mu of A also equals 0. So this would equal 0 times mu of B, which is mu of A times mu of B. And then what's the leftover case? So finally, we assume that neither a or b is 1, and that neither a or b is divisible by the square of a prime. That means a and b are each square-free numbers. a equals p1, p2, through pk, and b is q1, q2, through ql some distinct primes p sub i and q sub j. And note, and here we are finally going to be using this assumption that a and b are relatively prime, the pi's are distinct from the qi's. all i and j since a, b equals 1. Therefore, if I look at mu of a times b, what's the definition? Well, a times b is a product of distinct primes, and so the definition says it's negative 1 raised to the number of primes we're looking at, which is k plus l. Well, that's just negative 1 to the k times negative 1 to the l. And negative 1 to the k is mu of a, by definition. Negative 1 to the l is mu of b, by definition. So once again, mu of the product is the product of the mu's, and so we've established it's multiplicative in all cases. Okay, now, having formally defined the mu function, we now have to come back to the beginning and prove that the characteristic function we were looking for is really a valid theorem here. So we claim for any positive integer n, if I sum over the divisors of n of mu of d, this will come out to be 1 when n is 1 and 0 for all other positive integers. And thus, if we call this summatory function capital F, capital F acts as a characteristic function for the singleton point set 1. Meaning what? Meaning that this is a function that equals 1 when n is 1 and it equals 0 for all other numbers. So if you're graphing this function on the set of natural numbers, yeah, it'll equal 1 at 1, yeah, I gotta get a different color ink, and 0 for all other values. So it's a way of picking out the number 1. And then with slight modifications, we can then create characteristic functions of other types of sets, not just a singleton point set, but a set such as the set of square-free numbers or the set of numbers divisible by a square, things of this type. Okay, proof of the theorem. So let capital F be the sum over the divisors of n of mu of d. So the first thing I want to observe is that since mu is a multiplicative function, 
what can we say about capital F? Well, we proved a theorem last time that says if you put any multiplicative function here, the outcome is multiplicative. By a theorem from last section. Okay, so I got a multiplicative function. So we're going to do the three step procedure. We've observed that capital F is multiplicative. Then I want to evaluate it at a prime power. So what's f of a prime power? So I sum over the divisors of this prime power, which means mu of 1 plus mu of p, mu of p squared, mu of p to the e, which equals mu of 1 plus mu of p, and then what's going to happen from this point onward? Well, in all of the other terms, the exponent on p is at least 2. And so these are just going to be 0 plus 0 plus 0, which just equals 1 plus negative 1, which is 0. So capital F of any prime power is equal to 0. Then finally, in this three-step process, we say now let n be any number with factorization p1 to the e1, p2 to the e2, pk to the ek, and evaluate capital F of n. So capital F of n is then the product, I go in from 1 to k, of capital F pi to the ei, aha, we just discovered that every prime power, capital F, comes out to be 0. So this is just going to be 0 times 0 times 0 times 0, which equals 0, with one exception. Unless n equaled 1 in the first place, whence this was just a trivial product without any primes. And of course when n equals 1, f of 1 is just mu of 1, which equals 1. QED. In the next theorem, I'm going to show you how the Mubius function comes into relationship with the Euler phi function. So I have a theorem that says for any positive number n, the sum over the divisors of n of mu of d divided by d is the Euler phi function of n divided by n. And so note this theorem gives us another formula for the Euler phi function. So I just move the n over to the left hand side here and I get phi of n equals n times the sum over the divisors of n of mu of d over d. Now you'll recall we had this product formula for the Euler phi function before. It said phi of n is n times the product over the prime divisors of n of 1 minus 1 over p. And so that's saying that this part right here should be matching that part. And let's see if we can see why that's reasonable. So if I say n is a product of distinct primes like this, and then I look at the product over the prime divisors 1 minus 1 over p, so this would mean 1 minus 1 over p1, 1 minus 1 over p2, 1 minus 1 over pk, and when you multiply this out, you're going to get a lot of these singleton terms like this 
and they all have minus signs for their coefficients. And then you're going to get products of two primes, p1, p2, p1, p3, etc. And they're all going to have plus signs. Well, that means that's an agreement with mu of the product. And then eventually you get three terms, and you'll have a minus sign over p1, p2, p3. And so if you look at what we're ending up with here, you're ending up with all of the divisors of n, and then what's determining the plus or minus sign is the Mobius function of that divisor. And so you're getting exactly this type of form right here. Okay, but I want to do a direct proof of this theorem. So let's call capital F the summatory function sigma mu of d over d. And let's see if we can evaluate this. So the first thing to observe is that mu of d over d is a multiplicative function. since the top is multiplicative and the bottom is clearly multiplicative. Okay, therefore, capital F is a multiplicative function. So all I have to do is evaluate it at a prime power And what do we get? So I get mu of 1 over 1 plus mu of p over p plus mu of p squared over p squared mu of p to the e over p to the e. And this is why it's really nice to have the Mobius function around with multiplicative functions because these higher order terms always go away. So we get 1 this is a negative 1, and these will all be zeros. And so I just get 1 minus 1 over p. And so now we use the multiplicative property of capital F. So if n is the product of pi to the ei, then capital F of n is the product of capital F of pi to the ei, which is the product i equals 1 to n of 1 minus 1 over pi, and that is exactly the Euler phi function divided by n by the previous formula we had seen for the Euler phi function. So here I'm using our old formula. For the Euler phi function, which was that phi of n equals n times the product over the prime divisors of n of 1 minus 1 over p.